Recording in progress. Welcome back to the show, all you brainiacs out there. This is The Broken Brain, and I am Dwight Hurst, your host. Uh, for today's dose of culture, mental health, and uh, creativity, we got a couple of really cool things to cover today. I'm uh, joined by a, a new and old friend, because I can't remember how long ago we met, but uh, this is uh, D- David Rousen is here today. <laughs> To, to talk about uh, storytelling, to talk about pets, to talk about life, and just in general. That's a good... See, I try to make it so we can talk about whatever the hell we want. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about it all. We'll throw some food in there, maybe a nap or two. I'm, I'm, I'm down for whatever. Couple, yeah, thanks couple, for having uh, me. A couple of shots <laughs> for the gram. No, we, uh, David is a, I'm going to make sure I don't miss anything, a podcaster, a, a musician, a comedian, uh, uh, just a gentleman roundabout town. How would you add? Uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I compose music for film. I uh, I put out albums of music. I have this new. Uh, I wouldn't really call myself a comedian per se, but I do have an album of comedy music coming out uh, here in, in the next month or so. And uh, yeah, and I spend way more time than I probably should podcasting. I, I have my podcast, Piecing It Together, uh, which is a podcast you've been on and is about movies and the movies that inspired them. And I also produce other podcasts as well uh, and do various other work for podcasts, including jingles and editing and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, a uh, whole bunch of stuff. I also work with my family at our record store called Wax Tracks here in Las Vegas. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that last part. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. do you? I, I didn't know. Uh, is it a record like old school vinyl? Are we talking? Is that your? Absolutely. It's wow. a it's a converted house of three floors. That's all just packed. Like you have to walk over stuff. That's how like just oh, absolutely yeah. packed with vinyl and memorabilia and all that stuff. Love it, love it. That's really good. Is it also uh, uh, unorganized so people have to like really search? It's even better, yeah, in my I mean, yeah, we we try to keep sections uh, alphabetized, but good luck finding those sections in the first place. But once you get to them, you probably will find what you're looking for. But yeah, there's stacks and piles, and it's right. it's it's crazy. Yeah, I, the first thing I think of, of course, when you say this, is high fidelity. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys, your store is a little nicer than that one. Uh, Polite-wise. Maybe not. Maybe <laughs> my, not. My, my dad's an 80-year-old Brooklyn guy, and he's there. He's, like, the only one. Like, he's there every day, like, behind the counter. And so, uh, you know, make of that what you will uh, of what the experience is like dealing with him. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm there a few days a week as well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a really fun place. It's practically like a museum. Oh, that's wonderful. Wow. So now I got an errand here. I got to write on my bucket list real quick, actually, everybody. Um <laughs> Nice thing. I, I'm uh, intrigued. I really enjoy your podcast. And that's one of the things I wanted to kind of uh, talk about a little bit today is the, the we, we talk a lot on here about creativity, artistry, storytelling and things uh, uh, of that nature. I think your podcast is all about is storytelling. You can tell everybody the premise of it, but you're kind of taking apart stories from movies and looking at the different components and what well, I don't know if you're directly going for what inspired them, but you're looking for things that maybe tie together as far as ideas that have come back through. How would you describe that? Your, well, I usually do. do. Yeah, I usually do use the word inspired, but in a looser sense, though, yes, it could be just connections to anything that uh, feels similar, uh, explores similar ideas or uses similar techniques. Uh, But inspired is kind of an easier way to describe what we do on the show. Uh, I always say uh, the the tagline is a podcast about movies and the movies that inspired them. Uh, Because, you know, if if somebody is making this new movie, you know, of course, they're going to look to other films that have have uh, tried to do similar things in the past that they want to kind of either uh, do what they did or maybe steer clear of what they did or try a new approach to what they did. And so, you know, it, that is g- always going to be in the DNA of any new story that's being told. And we all know that, like, there there's no fully new stories. And, like, to me, that's something to be celebrated. Like, that is a connection between new stories and old stories and uh, the way they have similarities and differences and whatnot. And uh, to me, some people will hear the the concept and be like, oh, yeah, there's nothing new anymore. And I'm like, that that's not really the point. The point is that, you know, we are celebrating that and you can find recommendations for 
other things that explore those same ideas or you can uh you know find out like you know like oh this one did it this way this one did it this way maybe we could compare and find something in the middle that works all the way and then maybe uh my guests will bring another we call them puzzle pieces are the other movies we bring up during the conversation and uh you find something you haven't seen before but deals with similar ideas yeah uh, one of the things i think is kind of cool about this is i one of my favorite things about movie shows movie podcasts is when people will recommend especially they'll be like we're reviewing a movie and everybody will recommend one that's kind of inspired but yours is like a treasure trove because you have people bring enough puzzle pieces that you get a little deeper than just oh the meg was reminiscent of jaws because they both had sharks Mm -hmm. and then you know you get a little and i will say coming on it's like there's almost a feel of challenge like i don't want to be that guy you know (laughs) i mean you know we can say of course jaws but none oh that was all i had and so you get three or four deep and you're getting into some really interesting comparisons, right? Yeah, someone, absolutely. I, yeah. I, I've heard had a lot of people tell me that it feels like a game when they're on the show. Like, you know, it's what what's Dave going to bring up and what can I bring up to kind of come up with something that he isn't thinking of, you know, and everybody's always trying to, uh, you know, I don't want to say like be clever about it, but like, you know, it's just trying to find something interesting and unique to bring up as a piece that uh, we can compare and and lead to new discussions and tangents about the film. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a whole new appreciation of how people approach it. I'm like you. um, And that's actually one of the reasons why, I may not enjoy all of them, but when nowadays when something comes out that's a series or a movie that's a reboot of something and everyone's like, oh, no, they're remaking fill in the blank. Ah, Disney reboots. We hate them. And it's <laughs> like, I don't believe in hating things proactively, personally. Not not most. <laughs> sure. Not most. I should say most. I guess I'm grumpy enough to. But, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm all for reboots because that's how we got wicked for example if you've seen the mm. broadway musical or that's how we got fill in the blank of something else that was really cool if who anybody out there who likes something that was inspired by something else um i don't mind that they take a crack at it i just as soon yeah. see people you know have a swing and a miss rather than no swings there you go yeah, yeah. absolutely it's and you never know what yeah, you never know what you're going to end up liking. Like there are some movies. I mean, we're a couple of weeks away from our, you know, top 10 uh, midway through the year list that we always do a special episode on. And some of my favorite movies this year have just been total flops at the box office and critically uh, totally panned. But hey, I, I, I like what I like. And, uh, you know, you never know what you're going to like might end up being. Uh, something that's totally different from someone else. And yeah, I mean, you know, remakes, reboots, we do get a lot of them, maybe a little too many of them, but at the same time, some of them are actually really good. Well, and we're so bad at, at uh, this is a form of confirmation bias, but we get shorthand, I think, because of the internet. We'll read an article on Cracked or read a really funny tweet about pointing out some little thing that's like, oh, in the Crystal Skull, it was ridiculous because of this. And then mm. and then you remember to rewatch something or watch it if you didn't watch it because everyone's just like, this sucks. And you're like, uh, maybe uh, maybe I find it's not that bad. Maybe I even like it. Maybe yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess I'm channeling Crystal Skull because I know my family just did a big Ra- Raiders of the Lost Ark rewatch for some reason. Who knows why? Um, with the <laughs> ready for the <laughs> dial of destiny. Right. And yeah. it helped. It, it was interesting because watching the first three, which are pretty much regarded by most people, uh, at least whenever there's a good trilogy, that's a classic. There's at least two out of three that most fans like. It just changes which ones. But sure. Uh, But you watch those and you realize, oh, a lot of this was always silly. Mm -hmm. And so it set up the fourth one as, oh, some of the sillier things are actually they're just maybe their different style of humor because it was made in a different era. And maybe they missed the mark with some weird things. But, yeah, these were always silly. The, you know, yeah. the action was always a little bit like, oh, a fall and this hits the guy in the head. <laughs> and that's how mm-hmm. this no name. Do you ever notice that's one of my favorite tropes in movies, by the way, as long as we're talking about movies. Uh, is when people accidentally kill one or more henchmen Mm -hmm. in a way that if they killed the big bad that way, you'd be furious. Like (laughs) if you dropped an Uzi down the stairs and it took out the main bad guy accidentally, you'd be, everyone would be pissed. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Whereas it goes five nameless guys and it's like, (laughs) yeah, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes in these movies, like, yeah, it's the easiest thing to kill all these other people. And then the bad guy, you have to have the big showdown. Like it, it has to happen. If it was to happen any quicker than that, everyone would be all pissed off and annoyed. And uh, yeah, it's, I I don't know. I'm the good guy. And I get the good guy when you want him to be a good guy. The good guy's like, I'll let you go. And it's like, whoa, dude, you killed 50 people to get to this, uh, the, 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 this fool. And uh, now when you run into things like that, I wonder, do you find a similar feeling with tropes like that, where it's like they're recycling stories? And you mentioned that the strengths of that is, yeah. how do you feel about tropey tropes? Yeah. I mean, tropey tropes are part of storytelling. There, There's a reason that they keep getting used. It's because they work, you know, and there, there's only so many ways you can get your hero uh, from from the bottom up to that top level where the the main villain is, he's gonna have to go through a bunch of bad guys, or else you have no action in the movie. So you know you can't just kill the the main bad guy over and over again. Uh, you know unless it's some kind of I don't know multiverse thing or something, but that's even worse. I don't. I'm so sick of that trope, honestly. But <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean you, you kind of have to lean into some of those things sometimes, and that's why you know th- there's a lot of nostalgia going on right now. Um, um, I actually just saw a screening of The Flash last night. And so, you know, you get into, you know, the Batman is back, the original Batman. And like, it, it's it's getting to be a bit much. But at the same time, you know, those things do kind of speak to people. And the main goal here, I mean, it is a business. The main goal is to get butts in seats. And so, you know, you want to speak to people. You want to connect with them. And it's not necessarily cynical to admit that. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's not always – it doesn't always stifle art to have sure. those restrictions. At the same time, it obviously can. You get death by committee more with some than others. You know, I'll say too, I feel like almost any gimmick, device, MacGuffin, genre – I think I said all the ones I meant to. Uh, yeah. I think I think almost any of those can work. I mean, I'll throw out examples. You brought up multiverse. Uh, the, the new Spider-Verse movie is mm-hmm. a great example of using – just using the hell out of an idea like the multiverse, but yet still keeping it very personal. And I found mm. that any story that has a personal touch, like I would say a good idea is not a good story necessarily, right? Mm-hmm. If you have a good world building idea, like take Minority Report as an example, I think of where it's like, hey, that's a great idea, pre crimes unit. And I think that's why when they tried to make a TV show that was like a police procedural, it did not work. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't see it, I guess. I just read reviews that it didn't work. So there, I'm giving into that shorthand. But the movie was good because it was about one guy going through a noir-style futuristic adventure. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so that works better because it's about a human. And so Spider-Verse does a great job of saying, here's a multiverse. That's the gimmick. That's the idea. And then here's, uh, you know, here's especially Gwen and Miles' story. And very yeah. human, very, very individualized. Um, that's at least my take. Now you're going to say, oh, I hate the Spider-Verse. You know, that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. No, it, it was a lot of fun. But be enemies. It, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it makes me think of, though, is – um, over. No, yeah, right? Kidding. Seriously. <laughs> uh, not, not to stick in, in the Marvel world uh, because, granted, every podcast is talking about Marvel movies. But, um, you know, yeah, we just did a lot re- of that on here. Anyway. Yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, we, we just had Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which was fantastic. And we also, just a few months before, had Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which I am a huge Ant-Man fan. But that movie was so bad, like bottom of the barrel of Marvel movies. And the funny thing between that and Guardians of the Galaxy, which was so good, they're both just actors just like standing in a parking lot with nothing around them being real. You know, it's just pure CGI around them. But Guardians of the Galaxy pulled it off better because they had a story to tell and it was fun and there was actually witty dialogue and there was characters worth caring about. And so if you remember to make the movie around the tropes or the very simple, you know, CGI or, you know, whatever that is, that's, um, you know, overdone, I guess you could say, uh, as long as there's a movie still there, there's still something worthwhile. Yeah. And even when you're like, this is another thing that I actually really appreciate about yours. I feel like there's a lot, you're not a big Marvel guy. I'm more of a big Marvel guy, but I can still listen to yours and you, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I'm, I don't know if you can listen to mine. I'm not fishing for that comment, but, um, (laughs) fish, fish, not really, but, 
but you know, yours is one of those, and we've I tend to invite people onto the show who critique art in a way that loves art. And you're, right, you're right. like, oh, you know, that's not my thing, but here's what the, I think they were going for. And I sure. love that personally, because that's I feel like when I made that shift in my life away from the snark and embracing, I get what they were trying to do. You know, Mission right. Possible 2 is a remake of a Hitchcock movie. A lot mm-hmm. of people feel like it's the weakest in the franchise and didn't quite land. But I when I learned that, I liked it better. Right. Because mm. I realized they were swinging for something. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Intention is really important when it comes to a movie and intention goes back to uh, inspirations as well. You know, if, if it, they're intending for it to be like, you know, whatever classic and they're just trying to do like a modern spin on it or an action spin or a comedy spin or even like a gross out comedy version, like something where it's like taking something and, you know, making a different version of it, you know, that's inspiration. So that works as a puzzle piece on our show. Um, and intention is super, super important. Mm-hmm. Do you have any uh, ready thoughts or examples of things that have surprised you as you've talked to people about here's what either that you saw or that they saw, you know, somebody coming on being like the Adam Sandler movie, Jack and Jill reminded them of the African queen or something like that. Um, well, <laughs> I, I get some odd Patreon ones. episode. No, not yeah. really. I've only <laughs> seen one of those. People can guess which one. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I get some weird ones and some some very out there stuff some like random 80s comedy will pop up or all of a sudden it's you know some you know classic oscar winner from the 50s or something but like yeah it 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 can be all over the place i think you know there are certain things that we keep returning to obviously the star wars and and things like that just keep coming up over and over and over again and you really start to see how there are certain movies that have really informed like the language of, of how we make movies nowadays. Yeah. I, I'm also fascinated by how sometimes those things affect society too. Mm-hmm. I um, remember reading a big article about, see now here's where I could splice it in. If I, if I was self-conscious about not remembering the name of the <laughs> author of the Godfather, uh, John, something, 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 the guy who wrote the books. Um, um who, who's, uh, Pelosi, Palazzi, Nancy Pelosi. Um, yeah, <laughs> no. So look that up. That's a trivia. Someone tweeted at me, uh, with, you know, with great vigor and, and Puzo, Mario Puzo. There you go. I was close. Yeah, I was you close. Got it. Yeah. You were, you were good. <laughs> yeah. I, I've only seen the Godfather once, but, uh, Hey, you know, uh, did you care for it? Yeah, it's good. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, it's classic. Right? Spoiler, spoiler alert. It's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> Real happy and no, uh, real, real upbeat. No, it's a good uh, classic. But here's the interesting thing is the book first and then the movies. Apparently, the reputation of the book is so well researched. And this guy got to know the mafia and everything. And apparently he just made up a lot of stuff. Hmm. He just he invented some of the romance and some of the ceremony around mafioso kind of lifestyle. And and that got into the movie. And that really would be Play, you know, laid the groundwork for all of the Sopranos and all that kind of like just tough guy, you know, kind of with a little bit of romance and whimsy almost thrown into this criminal sure. world. And apparently not a lot of that was not a lot of that was true. Uh, mm. It didn't reflect a bunch. You know, they were just kind of more disorganized criminals. And it was but it was so cool looking that the mafia has has mafia members have copied that and mm. have adapted themselves. And that's their mentality of what it means right to be and, and how they act changed because of the movie <laughs> yeah. i think so there's a real in-depth human uh connection to how we do these kinds of stories and it's also fascinating to know which things might be being triggered by that when you talk about the inspiration mm. and your show brings that into the conscious awareness right sure sure of course but but i don't know do you see that i mean do you feel like that's a those components of media affecting culture and reality? I mean, certainly. I, I mean, movies are are always a big part. Movies, music, entertainment in general, all of it, you know, affects the way that the real world is around it. And then the real world then comes back in and inspires new movies. But you bringing that story up just gave me a good idea for a puzzle piece. If I end up covering that Flame and Hot movie about the uh, formation of Flame and Hot Cheetos, apparently that story is complete <laughs> bullshit. And, and <laughs> I didn't even so, know this was a thing. This movie. 
Like, yeah, this is a it's a movie that comes out on Hulu. Yeah, next weekend at the time of this recording. I don't know when this is going up, but um, yeah, it, it looks really fun. But the thing is, it came out that the guy's story that it's based on is is completely made up. And uh, so, but they went with it anyway and made a movie out of it. I'm using The Godfather as a puzzle piece on that one. Hey, there you go. Uh, hey, there you go. Another <laughs> made up story that they made a movie out of. Hey, so. Now all you fans, uh, listeners out there can go tune into that episode and be like, I know what's coming. It'd be yes. great. It'd be, it'll be, you'll have a, a clue to figuring out the puzzle of, of what David's going to say. That's, I there assume you, you can make that a feature too. Yeah. Uh, if anyone can correctly guess what you're going to say. And it is interesting the way that there is a connection that we have also to based on a true story, which is an interesting idea, which, and my understanding once again is most, if not all based on a true stories are, very loosely, you know, they're mm. pretty loosely based on the story um, because some like, real life stories aren't that exciting and they needed some, you know, they need to be juiced up a little. Yeah. And sometimes it's more of a, oh, I heard about this weird heist that happened. And so none of these characters existed, but I'm going to say based on a true story. You know, it's the hardest episodes to do on piecing it together are musician biopics because they're all I mean, I, I hate to say this because I'm sitting here talking about how, you know, inspirations are a positive thing, but they're the same movie over and over again. Just insert a different famous singer, you know, and uh, you, you end up like, yeah, this is inspired by Ray. It's inspired by Walk the Lion. Let, let's go to Walk Hard just for fun. You know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like it's the same ones over and over again. That's why, like. Just uh, last year, we had the the Weird Al one, Weird, the Al Yankovic story, which kind of was like a parody of musician biopic. So that was at least a fun twist on it. So we got to talk about some other kinds of stuff, parodies and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the, those are kind of the hardest things to do puzzle pieces for. That's interesting. I mean, so there are some story patterns that you find are just so there and baked in yeah. that the that would make it hard, yeah, to come up with anything that's like, what really wa this? Well, walk hard killed it all. Like, you know, the wrong son died, you know, like that whole thing <laughs> that happens in every single music <laughs> biopic. The dad, like, you know, hates the kid and you, know, you're, you don't make me proud. And like, you know, it's the same one over and over. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting <laughs> uh, what. Well, and they often involve a comeback, although not all. I mean, we saw Elvis, right, this last year or two. I don't remember if it came out last year or what, but um, that one didn't end with a comeback and a, anything like happy. <laughs> but yeah, but the overall story was here's the the destructive elements of fame and power and money. Yeah. Funny enough, that one is one that I could have definitely done because it was a unique take on the music biopic uh, being a Baz Luhrmann film and all. But I actually didn't do an episode on it. I did a, a little special mini episode with my parents because of our record store. So it's, you know, we have a lot of Elvis memorabilia oh, and like really rare, hard to find Elvis stuff. So, um, you know, it, it was it was a good opportunity to do a little uh, advertorial style episode. Oh, that's good. You know? I yeah, I just mostly I'd probably be picking sad things. That was mostly what I got of the movie. Well done, well acted, looks great. Sad, sad, mm. <laughs> bleak. Yeah, but, that's what the music business will do to people a lot of the times. <laughs> but uh, are there are there any things that you steer away from? Do you find that that there are movies that you just don't, you just can't even? I don't know if you want to, I mean, I'm not saying you have to mention them or not, but are there <laughs> tropes or genres? The only thing I could really think about is, is documentaries just because, um, you know, to say that a documentary is inspired by something else, like is a little bit tough, you know, like usually it's just a matter of telling this story about this subject. And so it, it kind of gets into something a little different than a narrative film. And so I, I've done a couple of documentaries here and there that have like very unique uh, vibes to them or, or like structures. But um, other than that, though, I don't usually cover documentaries on the show. Interesting. Sometimes they suffer from the same problem as based on a true story from what I mm. understand when you read things about it. Um, I what? Yeah. I, although, you know, there's a real, I feel like there's a real need in media. I talk about this all the time and also kind of an aversion at the same time to sincerity. I feel like we're in a weird time where sincerity is both a form of vulnerability that we crave and fear and mock actually. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, my, my favorite movie that wasn't Top Gun Maverick last year was 3000 years of longing. 
Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but that I movie is. Catch it. Yeah. I saw it the is, previews, of course. But. Yeah. It's as sincere as can be about storytelling and just how important storytelling can be for a person. And it just connected with me so much. And I know a lot of people were just expecting Mad Max Fury Road Part 2 because it's George Miller. And it just isn't that at all. And so a lot of people left disappointed. But for the movie that it is, it is just so beautiful. And uh, yeah, you brought up sincerity. I mean, that is a sincere movie. I feel like that's why there was a lot of popularity, even with the third Bill and Ted, which was, mm-hmm. let's be honest, you know, a little light when it came to anything. But then you look back at the other two and it's like, oh, here's a trilogy about how the world could be saved by people being nice. And sure, I feel like at the time when that came out, we we have such an obsession with darkness and kind of out darking each project. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you thought Breaking Bad was dark. Well, we're going to, you know chop off someone's face in the first 30 seconds, you know, the, um, but then you get something like that. That's just like sincere and sweet. And, and that's Mm -hmm. such a, such a big thing for people. I think when they find it, you know, yeah, absolutely. It'll it'll make something even better. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Especially like you said, there's so much dark stuff and don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of dark stuff, but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I I think a well-rounded media diet is good. (laughs) <laughs> what do you have feels for what makes uh, elements of stories that are powerful? We got a lot of creators, I think, out there that listen to the show, too. So why don't you shape the, uh, you know, shape all the entertainment that's going to come out over the next. Uh, they're all they're Apparently, I just decided they're all actively in the entertainment yeah. industry, too. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not really sure because I do like a little of everything, honestly. Like, you know, so I'm 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 open. I just. You know, it's everybody would say this, but I want more original stories, you know, and I I want them to feel, you know, like movies. And it, I know it's difficult for budgets and stuff like that nowadays and the rise of streaming. And, you know, luckily, it seems like theaters are kind of back right now. And so hopefully that's going to, you know, of course, we got a whole strike to deal with right now, which is definitely people need to, you know, make you know, what they deserve off of these movies that they work on. Um, so, you know, hopefully there's, you know, good outcomes to all that eventually. Uh, and we'll see some budgets starting to boost back up to where they used to be. But, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. I just want to see original stories and I want them to feel like fully fleshed out movies. And, you know, a lot of these streaming movies, they definitely feel, you know, the, like maybe they needed a couple extra passes, but they ran out of budget or something. <laughs> well, and it's such a range because you've got some that would just seem like they feel at home, right? In a theater, you wouldn't think mm-hmm. twice about, oh, this is in the theater. Not that, let's be honest, I don't want to over romanticize, you know, I mean, theaters have always, but particularly, it's so funny growing up in the 80s and then the 90s is when I was more like had a car and a and a and some money. And so I could go to movies and it was funny how you'd get some that were just great and some that weren't, but we didn't have as much of the fran. Well, I I don't know. I've counted, but it didn't seem like as much. And I'm a big consumer of a lot of the, the, you know, some of the big box star Wars. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty into it. Uh, Marvel. I'm pretty much, you could say a Stan for those. I really Mm -hmm. like them, but it is interesting. And I, I think people putting their, used to be, they could put their ticket price money into it. And now you get some of those original stories that do come out, right, on on streaming, and it's kind of hit or miss. But to find, you know, to put your weight and your viewing behind something, sometimes even just because it is a standalone original story, uh, to yeah. support that part of storytelling, you know, because that's yeah. where a lot of creative artists come through. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, I, with my podcast, we're talking about what movies inspired other movies do any of these streaming movies last long enough in the public consciousness to inspire anything? You know, that really remains to be seen. I I don't know. I don't think that these movies stay in the consciousness long enough. And that is another problem of the streaming era. And it's like, I know everybody loves to have all their content available for free or next to nothing. Obviously, you know, the economy is not great and we're, we're all, we all, you know, can use that break. But at the same time, I, you know, I love art and I love film and uh, I want to see these movies be something that is talked about all year long. I mean, look at Top Gun Maverick last year. I mean, just dominating, you know, that is something 
you know, for better or worse, however you look at it, is going to inspire movies in the next few years versus, you know, whatever streaming movie of the week that was forgotten about two weeks later. Right. I remember it was uh, last year or the year before, somewhere in there, uh, News of the World. I don't know if anyone saw that one. I'm just going to use it as an example because it typifies this experience for me. It was a Tom Hanks Western. That, oh, sure. Uh, and then uh, he was also in, uh, Tom Hanks was also in uh, Finch, which is a post-apocalyptic robot type story. I liked Finch. Finch yeah, was great. I, 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 yeah, I enjoyed both those, but I, Finch is probably my my. I like it better than the other, but those are two like major star, you know, Tom Hanks for crying out loud. He's a America's dad. No, but uh, you know, he's on those and uh, very, I find very few people that I talk to have heard of them even. Uh, Yeah. And that, that's a great example of two things that, you know, once again, once upon a time would be big. Oh yeah. It's a big Tom Hanks movie in the theater. And so it is interesting to see that. And I worry, I worry sometimes that some of the, we want all our content for free does lead into some of the, ooh, we can maximize our profits by just using AI, for example, <laughs> or whatever. Oh, yeah. I, I don't mean to get all off into that, this, this one, but you mentioned the strike and mm-hmm. there are something I like to see, but is going to impact us within uh, the next year or two, probably if it goes on much longer is we got directors and actors and SAG and, you know, a lot of them that are throwing their weight into Supporting the WGA, which I'm mm. for. I think that's great. Grind it all to a halt yeah. until they decide to make the people that produce these stories out of thin air, essentially, out of yeah. nothing. That's a writer. Um, they yeah. deserve to have have more representation and to make a living wage. Uh, or, you know. But also, it's going to grind things more to a halt, right? And how much of yeah. that do we fuel as, as consumers? Yeah. We want everything really great and really free. And uh, I mean, let's be honest, there's nobody out there more entitled than podcast listeners. I mean, I'll throw myself in there, too. You know, there's like, oh, I don't want to pay for it. And it's like, well, geez, how many episodes have I listened to of this show? And uh, yeah, I can't afford to support every Patreon, but I yeah. always make sure I'm supporting one or two, you know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Just, I, I was just going to say, like, whatever you do, don't look at the comment section of like a variety article about the strike because uh, all these monsters on the internet who are just like, you know, want it all for free, entitled to every single thing. And, you know, all, all I say about that as a musician, uh, you know, Lars from Metallica was right back when Napster came out. Uh, you know, he said that it was going to lead to everyone just expecting everything for free. And, here we are. So. Yeah, right. And mm-hmm. then to say, you know, with the data being hidden from streaming services, I think music and media, other media, TV and movies, uh, uh, that type of thing, uh, they're so proprietary and they keep that data so yeah. hidden that you don't really know if they send you a check. Does this represent how many times? I mean, Snoop Dogg was in the news recently, that quote, right, where he said, yeah. they tell me I got over a billion downloads. Shouldn't I get? What did you put? I don't. I think he said a million bucks or something like that. But he's just saying, like, how come I'm not seeing that? And what how yeah. does that work? And there's they're now notorious for going to their investors and saying we made a billion dollars, and going to artists and saying, eh, we pulled out our pockets and a little moth flew out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. The future is so stupid. Yeah, it's weird. Huh? <laughs> it's and all, you know, it's all really weird. <laughs> it's it's interesting too. I, it's like so many things. I look at social issues too, and I say it's going to be interesting to see where we land and what we think of to solve these problems. Uh, but how many people get hurt before? That's the part that's not so interesting and not so fun, yeah. right? Um, and and so yeah, flash forward twenty years, what are we going to be doing? Ho- hopefully, we will have accommodated and solved some problems. Then again. What happened in the first 15 of those years, mm-hmm. people leaving creative industries or or whatever? Um, yeah. Well, let's – I mean, I want to hear uh, – tell uh, tell people also a little bit about your work with uh, pets and just kind of – let's talk about pets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. While we're on this subject. Let's, so, let, wait, let's transition. A lot of movies yeah. are about pets. What do you think mm. about pets? <laughs> Oh, actually, I'm doing a live piecing it together on the movie Strays in August uh, at a movie theater. That'll be uh, a lot of fun. But uh, that's a kind of transition from movies to pets. And then we'll work our way from pets to my new album of songs about pets, the Pup Pups. How's that? Transition in the thesis transition. statement. You want to tell them yeah. what you'll do. You want to do it and then tell them what you did. Right. This is a <laughs> I'm channeling English 101. 
Nice. Nice. I like it. Yeah, no, I, I, I obviously I'm a musician as well. And uh, I've been working on music for films and putting out albums of very dark and mysterious and, uh, you know, electronic instrumental music for, for over a decade now, but all the while I've been kind of back burner off and on working on this album of silly, funny songs about my pets. And, uh, ever, ever since they were puppies and kittens and, uh, that it's finally time to put this thing out. Uh, my dog Harvey is 15 and a half and, uh, I want, want it to come out, you know, while he's still with us. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a really fun album. Uh, 16 songs actually with bonus tracks and be like around 18 songs, but, uh, it, it's all just really funny, little silly kind of pop rock, uh, folk rock, punk rock, like all different styles of rock and roll. Uh, some of them sung by me, some of them sung by them. Uh, we personify our pets and they, <laughs> you know, have different voices. And, uh, so they sing on some of the songs too. And, you get uh, them, like barking and stuff, or is it like a voice actor voice? Actually, uh, voice actor voice, but, um, we do hear Millie, the cat's voice, uh, actual meowing a couple of times. And then also Harvey plays a toy solo on one song. <laughs> uh, I recorded the squeaking of his toy and I, it actually worked out really well rhythmically with the, uh, with the song. Uh, so hopefully that's little, a first. <laughs> I think those little buttons that you record things on, like, like for the dog to ask for something or the cat to ask, right? And then, oh, yeah. Yeah, you for can record sure. that with lyrics. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's a really fun album. And uh, the album is called Who Wants Din Din. And uh, after all these years of delays, and working on it off and on it's coming out july 1st and uh i've been actually doing this past week that we're recording this um a pre-order bonus uh where anybody who pre-orders there's going to be a special uh bonus song that i'm recording that as many people as pre-order their pets names will be included in this song even if the song ends up being like 20 30 <laughs> And it's long. It's going to be a ridiculous opus uh, dedicated to all these people's pets. So uh, I think I have uh, 30 uh, names already to include in it. And uh, wow. we'll see if um, a few more get added before I end up recording it this weekend. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's just a really fun album. And I'm, I'm really happy to put it out. And then I've got a lot of my other music that I'm also working on that will be out soon. But uh, yeah, I'm excited about this thing. What made you uh, focus on pets? What are some of your general feelings about our relationship, our companionship with animals? They're the best. They're the absolute best. Like it, it goes pets, movies, music in that order. Like I, I love them. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're just, they're so much fun and they're so silly. And, uh, you know, our, our cat Millie just keeps us entertained just constantly. She's so ridiculous. And our other cat Neo just loves like spending time with me all the time. And our other cat Trudy is just a total goof and a weirdo. And, uh, and then Harvey is just the best. He's, he's, he's my, my little boy, my best friend. And, uh, his sister, Sadie, our, the dog that started the pup pups, basically, she passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, in, in the midst of making this album. But, you know, that's what happens when you delay an album for 15 years. You know, not all of the original band members have made it to the album's release. There was also a couple of other cats that we've had along the way. Um, I can but just they're imagine all... what the biopic's <laughs> going to be like for her. Oh, life. yeah. I, at least we know how to structure it, right? So yes, that's... absolutely. <laughs> no, it, it's true. There's actually a song on the album sung by her called Another Me. And uh, the, the chorus goes, You can find more socks, but you'll never find another me. Um, because she used to always chew up all my socks and, you know, we'd yell, Sadie, where are my socks? And so, uh, well, that so, must you know, have be, just... I mean, I don't know if you ever <laughs> listen to that again now, but the editing of that. Le oh yeah the loss must be super tears cool. yeah. just absolute absolute tears while editing it and getting it ready for release and uh, i've also I'm, I'm putting together some music videos and so you know going through old video footage and stuff like that it's it's been an emotional time <laughs> you know <laughs> one of the fascinating things for me is that when we engage and i guess you could say we do this with any relationship but with other humans we sort of never think about our mortality at least for a long time mm -hmm. um i've made the turn you know age wise to where I'm like, oh, oh, I don't used to think about it. Anyway, but that happens, you know, more as we realize it. But I think with pets, with they have such a shorter lifespan than we do. Yeah. That we, when we buy one, we are choosing grief, if you will. I mean, because <laughs> yeah. 
unless it's a parrot, it's going to outlive us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's a very interesting setup of expectation. Well, most of us don't talk about that. It's like, oh, I'm going to get this dog from the shelter. I, I found this great puppy, this great, you know, cat and whatever. Uh, and, uh, boy, it's going to be sad when it dies. We don't, I don't think we say that when we get it usually, Yeah, but it's in yeah. there, right? We know it. it. We know it that is. we're triggering a future sadness. Yeah. People need to understand that. And they, they need to think about the fact that this is, you know, for, for the life of the pet, like you, you, you know, you, that is your companion until the day it's gone. And that may be many, many years down the road, or it might be this year. Like, it's just, you don't know. And every day is a gift with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the few times where we opt in. And to me, actually, there's something about that. That's really admirable, healthy, impressive about, uh, just that dynamic and, and whether or not it's not for everyone, obviously, but usually sure. the reason people don't get pets, it's not always that reason. At least I think that's the minority. Usually it's because of the care and feeding or space or they either realize it's not going to work or they don't like, you know, having it around, but they don't say, oh, it's because I know I'm going to, it's going to be so sad. I'm sure some yeah. people have that, but I just not what I hear people say mostly is my point. Um, yeah. Yeah. The only time I hear people say that is when they went through that loss already. And it's like about why they're not going to get another pet, but. Or why yeah, they I, wait a few years. I've done that one before sure. where it's like, yeah, yeah, not ready yet. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine living a day without a dog though. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I love them so much and, um, you know, I'm not going to get another one until after Harvey's gone. I mean, he, he deserves every last minute of my intention in his elderly years, but, uh, you know, he, I don't know if he'd be able to handle another dog around, you know, so hopefully many, many years down the road, but he, he's actually had a heart condition for like eight years now that he's been living with. So, I mean, he's, he's still, still kicking though. And now he's entered the phase where he bullies us into treats like nonstop. I'm surprised we made it through this podcast recording, out. honestly. <laughs> so far, let's give yeah. him time. Don't yeah. count him out yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, famously, people, a lot, I think people are aware that, you know, a lot of uh, neurodiverse individuals and those also with depression and Mm -hmm. other, you know, uh, other things have found support with animals and animals being present. Um, There's the whole, I mean, obviously, there's emotional support animals, uh, which is, you know, a, a thing that happens more officially. But I think for for a long, long, long time, we've been aware of that. Animals sometimes are less complicated. There's, I mean, one of the most famously talked about is, uh, I think, comes from Temple Grandin and some of her stories and, and books that she's written about her affinity for animals as uh, as an autistic individual and now now a great educational and, and uh, neurodiversity researcher as well as a college professor. But she started out in the feed industry and working with uh, been working with cattle and working with ways to be more humane in that industry and, and how that yeah. uh, helped. And so there's that famousness. I, I feel like sometimes in, in mental health circles, we fail to learn the lesson that is, oh, this is good for someone who's got something going on. Well, mm-hmm. that probably means it's good, right? I mean, you know, we, <laughs> we discount that because we, we other people with neurodiversity so much and we other people who have uh, maybe mental health or, or depressive or anxious disorder uh, yeah. so much that we don't include ourselves maybe yeah you know sure um, yeah no that that's absolutely right and you know to kind of tie it back to movies again uh and you were talking about tom hanks earlier i don't know if you saw a man called auto earlier this year but i haven't um, seen it yet but yeah yes really good but i mean you know he he it finds the friendship of a cat, which kind of helps him open up again to people after grief and probably depression. And, you know, uh, although a lot of that's off screen, but we know that there's something up and, uh, yeah. And the cat is like kind of a, uh, you know, a reason for him to finally open up again. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, this is, this is a fascinating discussion. I really, I really enjoyed it a lot. I knew that I would, but having listened to and, and talked to you on your show, it's been, uh, it, it's always cool. Um, we're going to give you a shot to tell everybody where to find you specifically with all your various, uh, stuff. Firstly, I, I always like to ask people though, if they have a nonprofit or a charity or just a method of giving back or doing something for the community, that is near and dear to their hearts. It does not have to, it doesn't have to be related to what we're talking about, but it can be. What, uh, is there um, anything like that for you? 
I mean, I, I've done some stuff with some various uh, dog organizations here in Las Vegas. I guess I'll give a shout out to Potastic Friends. Uh, they do uh, rehabilitation for for pets, uh, for for dogs who need homes, who maybe came from you know situations where they need the help. Uh, and so, yeah, check out Potastic Friends. Uh, the the founders of that organization will actually be a guest on my Strays episode I had mentioned earlier uh, when we do that in August. So, um, yeah, check out Potastic Friends. Wonderful. And uh, where do people find you and follow you? Not physically. Yes. Don't follow <laughs> David physically. We're not endorsing yeah. stalking. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, find Piecing It Together wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media at Piecing Pod. And then for my music, my website is bydavidrosen.com. You can find all of my instrumental music albums as well as this new The Pup Pups album of dog songs and cat songs and as well as my film scoring work. Where's the record store? Uh, here in Las Vegas, Wax Tracks Records. Uh, you could find us on Facebook and all that to uh, find more info about it, see pictures and all that stuff. There's some fun stuff on uh, Facebook and TikTok for that. Y'all out there listening, some of you live around there. Don't lie to me. You know you do. And a lot of <laughs> you go on vacation there, too. So, hey, why not check it out? I'm, I want to see it. It's, that sounds pretty cool. I'm going to yeah. go trip over some vinyl records. Oh, you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.